Good afternoon, brethren. Hope you're well. Happy Sabbath to all those on the webcast as well. You'll find this message follows very well with Mr. Miller's message today. In this message today, I want to discuss two women in the Bible, explore what Scripture says about them, and then we'll examine a passage in the New Testament that mentions both those women. The two women are Sarah and Hagar. And the passage in the New Testament where the two women are mentioned is in the, mess, in the uh, epistle to the Galatians, written by Paul. So the title of the message is Sarah, Hagar, and Two Covenants. Sarah, Hagar, and Two Covenants. The message has three parts. Number one, it'll be about Sarah. Number two, it'll be about Hagar. And number three, about this passage in Galatians. So let's first discuss Sarah. Of course, you remember she was Abraham's wife. Her name was originally Sarai, and we read about her in Genesis 12. And you remember in that chapter that Abraham, Sarai, and Lot and their entourage, along with all her possessions, they move her from Haran, which would be in modern-day southeastern Turkey, and they moved to Canaan. Abram's family was originally from Mesopotamia, which would be modern-day Iraq. In both Genesis 12 and 15, promises are made by God to Abram regarding offspring, but not only that, a great nation and many descendants coming from Abram. Let's read those two promises. First, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Genesis 12, 1 to 3. And it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Let me read the second promise in Genesis 15, 2 to 4. Genesis chapter 15, 2 to 4. There it says, But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Verse 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come out from your own body shall be your heir. Two promises about offspring. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 16. I'll start with verse 1. Genesis 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. Hagar was likely acquired by Abram and Sarai when they had to stay in Egypt. That's covered in Genesis 12 because there was a famine in Canaan, and so uh, they went to Egypt, presumably for, for food. Verse 2. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. So they're childless as a couple. And it's been 10 years since they've settled in Canaan. And Sarai suggests the use of the handmaid, her handmaid, as a surrogate mother. And Abram agrees. So Hagar is given to him as a wife. And under Middle Eastern adoption laws, inheritance practices back then, the child of the handmaid could be adopted as the child of Sarai and Abram and become their heir. This practice sounds shocking to us. It's foreign to us. It was a custom at that time. As an aside, we know two generations later that Jacob had two wives and had children with both wives, but both those wives provided a handmaid for additional children that Jacob could sire. So in Jacob's family, there were 
children from four different mothers, which would cause any number of serious family and interpersonal issues, but the subject of my message is not Jacob. So in chapter 15, we read that the Lord God promised Abram numerous offspring as part of a covenant. Sarah knew of the promise, and she desired a son, but years went by, and when time passes by, it infects our thinking. Sarah was still barren. So in this chapter, instead of waiting on God's timing, Sarai and Abram take things into their own hands, and they do what they think is a solution. The plan doesn't work out well. We will see tremendous strife in that family because of that decision, and throughout history, there has been strife between the descendants of the child from Hagar and descendants of the child from Sarai. So now let's go to chapter 16, and we'll read verses 3 through 4. This is Genesis 16, verse 3. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. So again, Hagar was the slave, a handmaid to Sarai, but she is now able to bear a child, and now she has contempt for her mistress or her master, Sarai, because she's barren. And this causes strife. We'll read that in verses 5 to 6. Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do, as you, do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she, that's Hagar, fled from her presence. So we see ill treatment in both directions between Hagar and Sarai. And any of us today can imagine the stresses that would develop in a family like this between a surrogate mother and an adoptive mother, especially when one is a slave to the other and they're in the same household. Hagar runs away. But the Lord God speaks to her to go back to Sarai. We'll read that later. We'll read more later about what God says to Hagar. But for now, let me skip to verse 16. So this is Genesis 16, 16. It simply says, Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Now let's go to chapter 17. Chapter 17 brings out more elements and specifics brought into the covenant relationship between Abram, Abram and the Lord. The Lord changes Abram's name to Abraham. Abram meant exalted father, but Abraham means father of a multitude or father of nations. That is brought out in verses 3 through 5. This is chapter 17, verse 3. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Also in this chapter, we see instructions for Sarai to be no longer called Sarai, but Sarah. And we can see that in verses 15 to 16. Sarah means princess, which would be in line with Abram or Abraham, meaning father of a multitude or father of nations. Now let me go to verse 17. This is Genesis 17, 17, but I want to read this out of the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Probably a little easier to get what's going on. Genesis 17, 17. Abraham fell face down. Then he laughed and said to himself, Can a child be born to a hundred-year-old man? Can Sarah, a ninety-year-old woman, give birth 
So Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael were acceptable to you. But God said, no, your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will name him Isaac. I will confirm my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for the future offspring. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will certainly bless him. I will make him fruitful and will multiply him greatly. He will father 12 tribal leaders. I will make him into a great nation. And I will confirm my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. When he finished talking with him, God withdrew from Abraham. So note, Abraham laughs hard. He says to himself, can a child be born to a hundred year old man? This is about 13 years after Ishmael was born. Abraham was now 99. Now we know that Abraham had a relationship and a covenant with God, but again, given time and more years, when finally confronted with the declaration that Sarah would bear him a son, he laughs. And the passage indicates that he's not laughing out of happiness, but out of initial shock, even disbelief. But the passage also indicates that he sets aside this initial moment of laughter, and he does believe God. The rest of Genesis 17 is about Abraham circumcising all of his males and slaves in his household in response. So this teaches us that God can ignore and disregard initial responses of shock or surprise or disbelief, perhaps out of our own emotional response, and he looks overall at our character and belief. Sort of as an aside, but I'll point to perhaps in end times, perhaps God will provide all sorts of interventions and miracles and some of his followers are going to be surprised and shocked and even disbelieving for a short while until God impresses upon them. You don't think I'm going to do what I said I would do? Let me go to chapter 18 now. Chapter 18. This is the chapter where three visitors visit Abraham. I'm not going to go into the specific proofs, but we would understand that one of those three is an appearance of the eternal word in human form. This is a theophany, meaning a person of the Godhead appears physically on earth to be sensed by human beings. This is very different from when the eternal word of God was born as Jesus of Nazareth in human flesh to the Virgin Mary so that he could actually die to pay the penalty for our sins. I want to go to verses 9 to 15. So this is Genesis 18, 9 to 15. Then they said to him, where is Sarah your wife? And he said, here in the tent. And he, and this would be the person who is actually the Lord, and he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you, and according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. There's some humor in this passage. Sarah's first reaction is not believing. She thought it was outlandish at the age she was at. And perhaps out of embarrassment, she lies here by saying, oh no, I didn't laugh. Again, God overlooks these initial moments of shock and surprise and, or even disbelief 
when he sees that there's actually a foundation, a bedrock of belief and character. With all this laughter from Abraham and Sarah, the child is to be called Isaac, which means laughter. God has a sense of humor. Abraham and Sarah did too. Let's go to Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. This is Isaac being born. 21 verse 1, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore, him, bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh so that all who hear will laugh with me. So Sarah Isaac is born of Sarah. This is 14 years after Ishmael was born of Hagar. Just imagine how Abraham's life would change. And we'll also see additional strife in Abraham's family. We'll see that in verses 7 through 13. Verse 7 says, this is chapter 21, She also said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. So the child grew and was weaned. Okay, finished breastfeeding and taking on regular food. And Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, scoffing. So Ishmael is mocking, scoffing at Isaac. Verse 10, Therefore she said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac your seed shall be called. Yet I will make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. Verse 14. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water, and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. So we see this, we can, we can observe all this family strife and what caused it. But we do not look down upon Abraham and Sarah out of superiority because every family makes mistakes and there are conflicts to deal with, even when we do have a relationship with God. So perhaps purely by what we see in the Old Testament, we don't get a full picture that Sarah was full of faith. But I will now want to turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 11 to 12. I should have told you to keep your finger in Genesis, in Genesis, but I'm going to ask you to turn to Hebrews 11. And we'll just read verses 11 and 12. Hebrews 11, 11 and 12 simply says, By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him, referring to God, faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. So Sarah considered the one who promised to be faithful. Perhaps at first she had trouble grasping that she actually would have a child at age 90. But she arrived at a point where she firmly believed the Lord would do what he promised. And that's the kind of faith that allows that which is not 
humanly possible to occur, that which does not come about normally. Isaac truly was a child of promise. He was a miracle child. The New Testament mentions Sarah three more times. Two of those three times, it's a reference to, it's in Romans when Paul's referring to the, the, this miracle and that Sarah was barren. But I want to turn to the third of the, thir of the three, which would be 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3, and let's read verses 5 and 6. 1 Peter chapter 3, 5 and 6. It says, for in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and, not, are, not, and are not afraid with any terror. So Peter includes Sarah as one of the holy women in the past who put their hope and trust in God. And he mentions one of the other attributes of hers regarding a right relationship between husband and wife. So when a woman is doing what is good, she is following in the footsteps of Sarah, particularly in the proper respect of her husband. But note also this comment about verse 6, that she was not afraid with any terror. The NIV will translate this as, you are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says, you have become her children when you do good and aren't frightened by anything alarming. So we've covered the story of Sarah and her role in the birth of Ishmael through her handmaid and then the bearing of the son of promise, Isaac. And we've seen tremendous strife that came about in her family after she suggested an alternative way to have a descendant to which Abraham agreed. Part two of this message now is to fill in some blanks regarding Hagar. So I wanna go back to Genesis 16. Genesis 16. And this is back to the chapter after Ishmael is born, Genesis 16, and we'll read some verses that we didn't read before. Genesis 16, verse 7 says, Now the angel of the Lord found her, this is Hagar, by the spring of water in the wilderness. This is after Sarah had made things unpleasant enough where Hagar ran away. So spring of water in the wilderness by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sar Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. So the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. He shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Verse 13, then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who sees. For she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? Verse 14, we don't need to read verse 14. So actually in, in verse 16, Hagar bears Ishmael. So, we see that there are promises made to Hagar that she will have many descendants. And also notice the Lord is speaking to her directly. Not, women, not many women in the Bible have had the opportunity to hear the Lord speak to them directly. Now I want to go to Genesis 21 verse 14. 
We read the first parts of Genesis 21. We read about how Ishmael mocked Isaac after he was weaned. And so let me read verse 14 again. This is Genesis 21, 14, where it said that Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water, putting it on Hagar's shoulder. He gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. And then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. To our sensibilities, this sounds like really rough, maybe you can throw in the word cruel treatment, that Hagar and Ishmael are sent out into the wilderness. The marginal notes of the Holman Christian Standard Bible say that the wording of sending away of Hagar is the same kind of wording that you see in another context regarding setting free of a slave, and also in another context in the law about sending away a wife in the case where a husband has written a bill of divorcement. But I want you to notice that God told Abraham in this case to listen to Sarah and to not worry about the boy and her mother, that Ishmael would be a great patriarch of a great nation. So in essence, that boy Ishmael would be taken care of, would be all right. It doesn't mean Abraham was necessarily happy about it, but he followed God's instruction. So now in chapter 21, let's read verses 15 to 21. Chapter 21, verse 15. And the water in the skin was used up. This is the wilderness. And she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot. For she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of the Lord called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, what ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him up with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. Then she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad to drink. So God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. So Hagar cries out a second. Well, he, she cries out, and it's, a, it's the second time where it's recorded that the Lord God speaks to her directly. She and Ishmael are miraculously provided for. So other than the mention that Hagar despised Sarah upon Hagar becoming pregnant, we're not told anything else negative about her. It's always possible that Ishmael mocked Isaac from an example from his mother, but that's not stated. Instead, we see God talking to her at least twice when she was in great distress, and she did what God told her to do both times. So we don't put Hagar in some category of being against God, according to the biblical record. So we've completed part two of this message on Hagar. Part three, I want to cover the passage in Paul's epistle in the Galatians where Sarah and Hagar are mentioned. We have the background on Sarah and Hagar. Perhaps we have more background than we actually need to understand Paul's passage, but knowing more doesn't hurt. So let's go to Galatians 4, and we'll start off with verses 21 to 26. Galatians 4. Galatians 4, verse 21. Paul writing to the congregation. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? There are many times this phrase that Paul used, under the law, it, in many contexts it means under the penalty of the law. 
or under the penalty for breaking the law. And that penalty, as we know, is eternal death. In this case, that's not the meaning because it doesn't quite fit the context. In this context, it's talking about those who think that they can be justified by the law. Paul's basically saying, tell me, those of you who want to be justified by the law, don't you hear the law? Thinking that you can be justified by the law would be wrong understanding. It would be dangerous understanding. It would be harmful understanding. And I'll add, in addition, that this time in Judaism, they had added so much man-made law on top of what God instructed in the Old Testament. I'll just turn quickly to Galatians 3, verse 2. You don't need to turn there. But Paul asks in that verse, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or hearing by faith? It's a rhetorical question. The right answer, of course, is by faith. And, of course, faith involves a process of belief and repentance and baptism. But there's nothing that one can do on his own, such as to deserve to be justified and receive God's Holy Spirit. So back to verse 21 of chapter 3. It says, don't you hear the law? And here the word law in context means not just commandments in the law, but it refers to the entirety of the first five books. Because we'll see in the next verse, Paul points to something that we've already read today, which is in the book of Genesis, the first of the five books. So this is chapter 4, verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. Now, I'll just add that you know that Abraham had other children through a later wife named Keturah, but Paul's not concerned about that. He's focused on Ishmael and Isaac. Verse 23, But he who was born of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman born through promise. So one was the result of Sarah and Abraham making a decision to have a Hagar bear a child of Abraham. And Hagar was a, a fertile young woman who had no problem in getting pregnant. In other words, no miracle required. But for Sarah to have a child, it would have to be through promise and miraculous intervention to override the issue of her old age and her barrenness. Verse 24, which things are symbolic, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar, for this, is, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. So back to verse 24, it says, which things are symbolic? The Greek word there is from where we get the English word allegory. And some translations will say illustrative or typological or allegorical. An allegory is simply a narrative that has symbolic meaning. In other words, Paul is saying Hagar and Sarah represent something else, but he doesn't ask us to guess at it. He tells us directly they represent two covenants. And notice in verses 24 to 26 the associations. We got Hagar, the slave, associated with Mount Sinai and the covenant made at Sinai and the city of Jerusalem at the time of Paul, which was the center of Judaic authority. And then note the associations of the free woman, Sarah, with Jerusalem above, and Jerusalem above is stated as free and is figuratively a nurturing woman. The phrase Jerusalem above may not be very clear, but at minimum we know it's free, it's not enslaved, and since, it's not, since it is from above, it's not earthly and physical, but it's spiritual and heavenly. So please put your finger in Galatians 4, and I want to turn to Hebrews 12, because I want to give clarity to this term, Jerusalem above, in Hebrews 12, 
supplies that to us. Whether or not Paul is the writer of Hebrews, it doesn't matter. Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 24. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So the new covenant is not like the old covenant. The old covenant required physical methods of becoming or remaining ceremonially clean. The new covenant is the reality of what many of those physical things in the old covenant point to. A sacrifice, and this is saying some of the things Mr. Miller did, a sacrifice that could truly remove sin true forgiveness of sins, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, the law written on one's heart through the indwelling of the Spirit, and even eternal life in the eternal kingdom of God. Now I want to say a few things about this allegory, and we haven't gone through it completely, but it's important to make these notes because some people are going to read this and they will run with it and make all sorts of broad, incorrect assumptions. Number one, note that Paul is not commenting on the character of Hagar and Sarah. It's not a case of Hagar bad and Sarah good. We've already seen that in both respects, they had aspects of their character or life experiences that were good and others not so good. Sarah is, yes, in the faith chapter, Hebrews 11. But both are like any of us. We sometimes make good choices, and sometimes we make unwise choices. Another note, Paul is not commenting on the descendants from the slave woman as bad, and the descendants of the free woman as good. He's not making that point at all. Another thing to note is that he is not saying the covenant at Sinai is bad. And the new covenant is good. Please go to 2 Corinthians 3. 2 Corinthians 3. Actually, I want to read this from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Second Corinthians 3, and I want to read verses 7 through 11. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, and there he's referring to the Old Covenant, the ministry of righteousness, referring to the New Covenant, overflows with even more glory. In fact, what had been glorious is not glorious now by comparison because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was fading away was glorious, what endures will even be more glorious. So let's be clear that there was a glory to the Old Covenant, but the New Covenant has a far better, more glorious characteristic. Also, let's go to Hebrews 8, verses 6 to 7. Since this allegory is covering the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, we certainly want to get the right perspective on it to see what Paul is saying. Hebrews 8, 6 to 7. Hebrews 8, verse 6 says, But now he, referring to Christ, has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, referring to the new covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second so the new covenant is a better covenant with better promises. I could actually say much better promises. But it still implies that the old covenant had its godly purposes and its good promises. After all, who gave the covenant at Sinai with Israel 
and instructed them with the law, the Lord God. How can something be bad when it's from God? Another thing to note is that, oh, I just wanted to read verse 10 of Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8, verse 10. This is breaking into the middle of a citation from Jeremiah. But verse 10 says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So this applies to any Christian who has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that the law now is written on the heart to make possible the keeping of the law through the Holy Spirit. Back to the notes I wanted to make about Galatians 4. Paul does not make the association of the covenant at Sinai with law and the new covenant with grace, as if grace and law are total opposites. No. The old covenant certainly had aspects of grace, and we know that the new covenant certainly includes God's law written on the heart. So Paul's not setting up some grace versus law kind of formulation. The Church of God has summarized this understanding over the years by saying God's purpose is a way of grace and law, not pinning law and grace against each other. Another thing to note is that Paul does not say the law given at Sinai is bondage or slavery. Paul understood that the law was given by God in Romans 7 verse 12. You don't need to turn there. He says, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy, just, and good. So Paul knew that the commandments reflect God's mind and his character. So that seemed to be a, a long list of notes, but it's important because some will take this passage and arrive at wrong understanding. Just one other note, Paul does not use all the events in Hagar's and Sarah's story in his, al in his allegory. He chooses a very few. So we should resist the temptation to overextend Paul's use of the allegory. So now when we look at the allegory, we see I only found six items that from the lives of Hagar and Sarah that he uses. Number one, one was a slave, the other was a free woman. Number two, Abraham had two sons, one born of the slave woman and one born of the free woman. Number three, one bears children into slavery, and the other bears children who are free. That's just the nature of being a slave or a free person. Number four, one bore a child through normal circumstances, and in the other case, it was a child of promise requiring a miracle. And two more that we'll actually get to, because we haven't read those yet, the child born of the slave persecuted the child born of the free. And number six, the slave woman and the child were sent out and thus not part of the inheritance. So back to Galatians 4, and let me just finish the chapter. This is verses 27 to 31. We had left off after verse 26. So now it's verse 27. For it is written, rejoice, O barren. You who do not bear, break forth and shout. You who do not travail, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now understand that Paul is quoting from a passage in Isaiah. This passage in Isaiah is not directly aimed at Hagar and Sarah, but Paul finds it useful to use. And I think we can see that Sarah and Abraham rejoiced when Isaac was born. She who was barren and desolate now had borne fruit. Verse 28, now we brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. Isaac was the child of promise, as we said. 
And so Paul's continuing that typology and saying, those of you called to be Christians under the new covenant are children of promise like Isaac was. Isaac was a miracle child requiring God's intervention. Being from the free woman represents the new covenant. It means that we have freedom from sin, freedom from being a slave to sin. The old covenant incorporated God's law, but it did not provide a way of escape from that bondage derived from Satan, the world, human nature, and sin. So now we can we know that we have the penalty of sin removed through the sacrifice of Christ, and now we can view God's law as a law of liberty, enabling us to serve God freely. I'm going to quote two passages from James. You don't need to turn there. But both of them use this term, the law of liberty. It's not a law of bondage. Verse 23. So James 1 verse 23, it says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what the kind of man he was. But he looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. And he's not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. Also, you don't need to turn, to turn to James chapter 2, verse 12. But that verse says, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. You don't need to turn to this reference. Romans 6, verses 15 to 18. Romans 6, 15 to 18. But Mr. Smith used Romans 6 extensively in his message a couple weeks ago. It basically says we're not enslaved to sin are not the slaves of sin, but rather slaves of righteousness. So there is a purpose by God to call children a promise. And there is a miracle and intervention to fulfill that promise. Being of the free woman, Sarah, under the new covenant, is not of ourselves through our normal human behavior and our own willpower. It takes God's intervention, his involvement to be called of God and then to accept the sacrifice of his son for our sins and to receive the promise of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So by God's grace, some are called to be children of promise in this age and they respond to that call. And those of us who have the indwelling of the Spirit through repentance and baptism are what we call first fruits. And in God's plan, reflected by the annual holy days, there is opportunity for all to become children of promise and to choose that way, but in different phases and ages of God's plan. And expounding on that would be a subject of another message. Verse 29, this is Galatians 4 verse 29, I actually read that, but that's the verse. No, I didn't read that. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even it is so now. So Paul is referring to the taunting of Isaac by Ishmael. And just like that, there was persecution of Gentile Christians in the early church by those who insisted that for one to be in the church, one had, to, one had to be a Jew first, to be a convert to Jew, Judaism first, and be under the Sinai covenant. And the entrance into that covenant would be circumcision. And for those teaching that, it was not only entrance to what God instructed at Sinai, but it would be entrance into a bunch of added regulations. By this time, the rabbis had added regulation upon regulation that, had been, that became part of Judaism far beyond the instruction in the books of the law. So Paul observes that those who believed that they had to be under the Sinai covenant were causing trouble to those who taught that they were under the new covenant through the sacrifice of Christ. 
And by extension, any of us under the new covenant can be persecuted in general by anyone who does not have the indwelling of the spirit and lacks the understanding of how children of the free woman should be living. Verse 30, nevertheless, what does the scripture say? And now he's going to quote from Genesis, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So he's implying children of the slave woman, they don't inherit. And we can see the spiritual application. Verse 31, so then brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We who have the spirit of God are under the new covenant, not the old. That's what's being said. And understand that this is, this instruction, Galatians 4, is a continuation of what Paul is instructing throughout the book of Galatians. I just want to pick up two verses in verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 15 to 16. Because this is also showing understanding that Paul was trying to refute. This is Galatians 2, 15 and 16. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So, suffice to say, Paul is not anti-law, but he's giving the sternest of warning against attempting to justify yourself through the law and to watch out for those who might be teaching that. And it's not in this message, but we can find so many other places where Paul instructs that because we are Christ and we have the indwelling of the Spirit, that we are to be obedient to God's instruction. And that obedience to God's law and instruction is both a characteristic of the converted mind as well as what the converted mind would want to do. So Passover is a few weeks ahead, and hopefully this message has provided understanding about the new covenant versus the old. We covered Paul's allegory involving Hagar and Sarah, representing two covenants. We covered background into the life of Hagar and Sarah to understand the allegory better. We saw that Paul was addressing the wrong notion that was circulating in Galatia, that we can be justified by the law and not by repentance and accepting the sacrifice of Christ. And we also see that the allegory of Galatians 4 is not trying to set aside God's instruction in the law. Continuing to obey God by the power of his Holy Spirit is the right response to the reality that God has delivered us from bondage of being under sin. We are under the far better new covenant, not the old.